Yeah, I think uh, Tale of Two Cities, really. We, we started with Omicron, uh, right? Our, our book year is broken, uh, as we say, so February, March and April. So February is still very much Omicron affected and then gradually really getting up to or getting up to speed. Um, we definitely see that underlying, let's call it pent up demand being there. We also see that going into the summer. Um, then, as I said, a tale of two cities. So all of that really quite positive, including our cash balances where we are clearly not making enough progress is on SES Forward. And there we've also been quite outspoken today in, uh, in our report. And what is it uh, that makes you not going forward as you wish with SES Forward? Yeah, one of the things I think is that people probably are still expecting or hoping for, um, let's call it a miracle solution, um, right? A, a creative solution to the challenges that we're facing. Um, and in our view, of course, there is none other than the SAS Forward Plan. And that is what we as management and certainly also management and board are focused on, right? We need this plan to be implemented. We're really focused on SAS Forward to make sure that we get the long-term position of the company right. But so what will it take to get employees to come back to the table? Oh, it's, it's much broader than that, right? I don't like to focus on, uh, on one single stakeholder. This program is designed really to make sure that everyone participates and that we all do that pretty much at the same time. What we need to do here, and let me give you a very practical example, um, for two and a half years, Asia has been closed, right, for, for the duration of the pandemic, and it's still closed. Then, when finally we thought we could start opening up again, Russia invades Ukraine, the Russian airspace is closed, and therewith, again, we cannot overfly Russia to fly to Asia. For all of this time, we have been paying for the aircrafts that we co couldn't use and that we still cannot use to fly to Asia. We're paying for those. We need to find a structural solution, a fleet restructuring with our lessors to make sure that this company is and can be competitive. Yeah, and but I still want to ask you a few questions about different stakeholders in all of this. What will it take to make uh, creditors convinced that they need to convert their to equity? Well, it requires, in the end, one big overall and overarching thing, which is this company needs to be competitive. We need to be able to stand on our own two feet. And that goes for lessors. It, of course, goes for the other stakeholders, including labor and everybody else. If you only tackle, in a way, if you only solve one of the problems or one of the challenges that we're having, then you will only be marginally better off. We need all of these different components to come together. SAS needs to really stand on its own two feet. Only then will we be able to attract the new investors. Because that's what I also like about your question. You, you clearly link it to attracting that new capital. And that is exactly what we're aiming to do. Yeah, and how will you be able to uh, attract that capital? You write that you need will seek to raise not less than 9.5 billion in equity capital. What kind of investors are we talking about? Is it a private capital or how will you be able to raise it? Yeah, so once again, how will we be able to raise it is by being competitive. And that's why this program is, as we call it, a very comprehensive business transformation program. This is about being cost competitive, making sure that at least half of that debt, right, the 20 billion that we're talking about, is converted to equity. And then we will be able to raise through serious investors the money needed for this company. Um, we have had and we are having very good and I would say constructive, hopeful conversations with a variety of investors on that. And I would think really there is appetite, um, but there is only appetite if this company truly can transform itself and be competitive. And so, but how can you then handle the growing competition from other airlines who have a substantially lower cost structures? 
Well, how, how can we do that if we're not competitive, I think, is, is, is the other question, right? So there is only one alternative, and that is why we are so focused on making sure that we are cost competitive and that also, as I said, we convert part of that debt into equity. I want to go back to that fleet example, right? The number of wide-body aircraft that we have kept on paying for all throughout the pandemic while we were not using these aircraft. And now we, in a way, wake up from right the pandemic and the whole world starts again and we can still not utilize these aircraft. That requires, therefore, a very simple, and I think most people will understand this, it requires a structural solution to the fleet problem. And uh, with all this in mind, what role does the states play in all of this? Should we expect then the Swedish and Danish states to be diluters in a new round issue or how will that work? Yeah, we are of course talking to every single one of the stakeholders. Um, that of course includes the states. We have also very clearly outlined today in the press release that we have issued what exactly we wish to convert into equity. There is the state instruments in there as well. I will not comment, of course, on individual negotiations, but yes, we are, as you would expect, in touch with all of the stakeholders. And that is why I think it's important today that we have shared the amounts, because now finally people will understand that it is really a substantial um, program that we're talking about. Nine and a half billion of equity that we intend to raise and 20 billion of debt that we intend to convert. But what will happen if you don't get the money? Um, well, first of all, it will tell me that we are not competitive, right? Because I do think that for any competitive airline company that really has a future, there will be the right investors um, available, right? People will, of course, then be willing to invest and, and, and join us on the future ride. So I think, again, let's start there. We have to do the things that we have to do, and we have then to make sure that our ecosystem, our suppliers, our partners, our stakeholders team up with us, and then we're able to, inv to, to get the right investors to the table. But can, just to be clear, you're positive that you will be able to get the right investors? Yeah, I, I do think so, right? But on one condition. Um, we have to be, and I'm repeating myself, but we have to be able to stand on our own two feet. Um, this is a company that has, of course, had a challenge with a cost structure that is not completely geared towards where the market is. And since the pandemic, we have seen a few things happening. Okay, Asia being closed, no Russian airspace open. How long may that last? No one knows. Fuel prices again up. But the most fundamental change is what we see happening, of course, in that space in the demand side, in the market itself. And we have seen that leisure rebounds faster. We also know that leisure, for instance, is far more peaky, peakier, um, right? It, it goes through the uh, seasonality cycles far more in summer and in holidays than, for instance, business, right? So we have to, as the original and traditional business airline of choice, we have to also adapt. We cannot sit still. We have to go forward into that new future where the market is. Yeah. And uh, then moving forward, uh, I also know that fuel and exchange rates are affecting you. What is done to handle this? Yeah, so first of all, it is indeed affecting when you look at the last few months. Um, I think at an operational level, we really got, call it awfully close, um, right, at an operational break-even level. But because of um, fuel and rates of exchange, yeah, it, it's all wiped out, right? That is the normal, in a way, circumstances already of the, of the industry. But the challenging fact for SES is that because of um, the well, call it challenging financial situation, uh, we are not able to hedge. So when you look at our fuel hedging, for instance, it's zero at the moment, and that won't be very different for the um, immediate future. Yeah, uh, but can, as a traveler, uh, should, should one expect that uh, 
this uh, then instead will be added on ticket prices? Um, we, we will always optimize, of course, our capacity and, and demand balance, right? That is, that is not something um, that you do in that sense for commercial reasons. That's really what you do for financial reasons in the first place. So hopefully there will be also some discipline going forward with higher fuel prices. But really, that's not what we're looking at. At this moment, you really do see that pent-up demand. We see people wanting to travel this summer. I think, once again, my main question is, what happens in the autumn, what happens in the winter season, um, we don't know yet, but right? that is too early to tell. Yeah, but then just looking at the summer, we've uh, been reporting about the fact that you've uh, cancelled uh, about 4,000 flights. Uh, can you give me an update there? Will more flights be cancelled or will you be able to deliver on your sold tickets? Now, what we have at the moment is um, operationable. Uh, we have every single flight uh, staffed with pilots and crew. And on top of that, we have between 10 and 15 percent of standby levels on both pilots and crew as well. So there is something of uh, disruption that, of course, we can absorb. I think the issue is far broader. Um, I, I do think that this is something where SAS actually took its responsibility, we took those flights out, and of course we are sorry for the disruption that it caused, we are, but I do think that that was still the right moment to do it. That was a moment when we could still, um, if you like, reorganize the summer and make sure that those people that were affected had a different flight. The vast majority of those people got a flight within a few hours before or after. What I now see happening, uh, right, airport infrastructures, um, it is going to be quite a challenge. And there we at least have made sure, like I said, to have our house um, as best as we can prepared for this summer. Every flight has pilots and has crew and we have a buffer. And I also wanted to ask you, there has been some talk about discontent at SAS with you as the CEO. Is that a perception that you have? Uh, sorry, I d really did miss you for a second. There has been a, sorry, a perception uh, of? Uh, no, but uh, that there has been some discontent with you as the CEO. Do you feel that you have the company behind you and, and the trust of you being able to handle uh, as, as going forward? Yeah, I, I do think so, and I also would hope so. Look, these are not easy positions, and these are clearly not easy um, eras, if you like, right? We're coming out of a very significant crisis altogether, um, right? It goes for every single airline in the world. And we are now hit with, for instance, that Russian airspace closure and the need to really go through the SAS forward plan. I can, of course, imagine that that is not easy, right? And once again, we have also said this very clearly this morning on the analyst call. I really want to thank all the employees of SAS because it's not been easy. It's a very resilient company. It's a very resilient workforce. But we've had a lot to deal with over the last few years.